Hello, everybody. Welcome to the, um, the webinar uh, hosted through CHPCA. My name is Gloria Praveen, and I'm going to be the moderator for this session. Um, I would like to acknowledge before we get started that I am located on the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish people. Um, this land is also known as Vancouver. Um, the NAVCARE project itself is situated on the unceded territories of the Silix people, also known as beautiful Kelowna. Um, as a second generation Canadian, I am grateful for the opportunity I have to learn and live and play on these lands, which stimulate me to be curious and creative. And I would really like to invite you to reflect on how you work and how your work and practice is informed by the land and communities um, that you're located on. So I would like to introduce to you my esteemed panelist. I'm so delighted to uh, introduce Holly Bovenkamp and Joy LeBlanc, um, both from the Camrose Hospice Society in Camrose, Alberta, Erin Thompson from the K-Line Center in Nelson, BC, and Anitra Bostock from the Teresa Deller Palliative Care Residence in Montreal, Quebec, as well as the lovely Dr. Barb Pissett from the uh, University of British Columbia in the Okanagan. So our plan for today is to share with you a little bit about what is NAVCARE, and then uh, we'll move into giving some details about the funding call to develop NAVCARE hubs. But the bulk of the session is really going to be situated on the key considerations to implementing NAVCARE. And that's where the panelists will be joining us, and they're going to be sharing their insights about how they've implemented NAVCARE. And, uh, and so we're really, really excited that they're here to share their, their wisdom in this area. Um, and so hopefully by the end of the session, you'll have a better understanding of the NAVCARE program. You'll have, uh, have learned and, uh, about those five considerations for implementing NAVCARE and thinking about how they might be applied to your own organizational context. And then of course, to learn about the funding opportunity for the development of NAVCARE hubs. I just would like to add that we will have a question period at the end, but feel free to drop your questions in the chat chat function and we might not be able to get it, get to it right away, but uh, that way you'll keep them. Uh, oh, we've got one already. <laughs> uh, I will try to open that. Uh, yes, Jennifer, uh, the question was, will the slides be shared? Absolutely. You'll receive a C, uh, an email from CHPCA. They'll be sharing, um, sharing the slides with you. Um, so um, hopefully by the end of the session, we'll be able to get to all your questions. But um, if I notice that some of them are really aligned to the topic that we're talking about in the moment, then I'll bring those questions in. Whoop. So um, just to acknowledge our funders, NAVCARE over the years have been supported by the generosity of many funders. And I'd like to acknowledge um, the financial contribution from Health Canada, who are making this um, funding for the hubs um, possible. And then also like to thank the NAVCARE volunteers who, as one client has said, really helps make life more livable for persons living at home with declining health. And also, thanking all those individuals who joined the NAVCARE as research participants. They have provided such incredible wisdom about their experiences and their commitment and their feedback has really given us the opportunity to create a real stellar program. Um, and so I'm very grateful to all of those who have participated in that capacity. So I'm gonna turn it over to Barb, who's gonna lead us through a bit about what NAVCARE is. Thanks, Gloria. And thank you all for attending today. It's just uh, wonderful to have you. I'd like to begin the presentation with a bit of a story because for me, it really typifies what we're trying to do in the NAVCARE program. I want to tell you the story of John. John was a 75 year old man who was living at home independently with his wife of many, many years. Um, she had dementia and he had been her family care, her, her caregiver basically for five years. John actually fell one day and broke, broke his hip and needed to go, of course, into institutional care to have his hip fixed. And of course, because he was the primary caregiver of his wife, she needed to be hospitalized as well. Sadly, she died when, when she was in hospital with him. 
And he returned back home once he was able, um, sad, having lost his purpose in life, having difficulty getting around, and really feeling at a bit of a loss as to how life was going to look from here. Now, John was kind of at a fork in his life. And, and I know many of us who've been in healthcare have seen this fork over and over again. On the one hand, after such a, uh, an incident and that profound grief, you can really travel that path of quickly deteriorating health, deteriorating health and death. Or you can travel another path where you create sort of a new meaning in life finding a new engagement in life and new su supports. And this is where a skilled volunteer really, really comes into play. They can come alongside somebody like John, they can help them to find new meaning in life, to have social support, to get engaged once again with things that are meaningful to them. And really that's the focus of the NAVCARE program is having that skilled volunteer come alongside people who are traveling that path of declining health and are at risk. So the goal of the NAVCARE program is to provide specially trained, mentored and experienced volunteers to work with persons and their families living with declining health to improve their quality of life. NAVCARE is a compassionate community program. And what I mean by that is that many communities, of course, around the world are trying to have compassionate community charter status, where they really embrace that idea that we're, you know, we're really going to care for those people in our community. And NAVCARE is one program that you can implement to help realize that ideal. I love this quote by the BC Centre for Palliative Care, living in a community that cares for each other, makes us happier, keeps us connected, and helps us to find meaning in life. So uh, the goals of the NAVCARE program, NAVCARE, as I mentioned, is really centered around quality of life. And that's a really important concept, because even though we use the concept of navigation, we are not trying to navigate healthcare services in this program. What we're trying to do is prepare people who can do that sort of day-to-day -day quality of life navigation in that sort of interim place between where people require things to make their lives more livable on a daily basis, but it's not about navigating healthcare services. And I think that's a really important distinction. And we have four basic goals and they're very much match sort of the palliative care policy goals for Canada. One is to provide early support to individuals living on the trajectory of declining health. And we often think about that as a palliative approach to care. The second goal is to really build volunteer capacity. Almost every policy document across Canada as it relates to palliative care has talked about the incredible role of the volunteer in enhancing the quality of palliative care in our country. And so we're really trying to contribute to that initiative. The third goal is to really optimize the available resources in any community. Prior to this program, Wendy uh, Dougalby and I had been doing a fair bit of research in rural palliative care. And what really fascinated us was the number of sort of organic resources in each community that very few people knew about. And so the NAVCARE is one way to really make sure that those resources get used, somebody knows about them and can direct people in that direction. And then finally to build social capital and connection. You know, we know that, you know, 95% of palliative care operates with families and communities. And so, you know, our challenge now before us as a country is how can we really mobilize communities um, to, to make that contribution? So many people are willing. So how can we provide a framework for people to do that? So what do NAVCARE volunteers do? Well, they develop relationships. These are people who have the luxury of time to hear stories, to share a cup of tea or to take a walk. They assist with the tasks that persons with declining health find it challenging to navigate. And so that may be everything from grocery shopping to finding certain things that they need to accommodate difficult um, mobility issues to transportation. And it's not always that these volunteers actually do these things but they are really are people that reach out to help people find resources to do that. And that's the third, finding the resources and local services that assist persons. They do a lot of listening. As persons make the transitions and decisions that arise out of declining health, we've done a lots of evaluation around this program. 
And the thing that we hear over and over again is the valuable role of the volunteer just in listening to people, what they're doing. And, and in that listening process, people are able to sort through their decisions. And finally, to provide a safety net for those living at home alone and without family nearby. So it's a check-in system for these people. It's a bit of a, a almost a surveillance system where people have somebody that keeps in touch with them um, so that they're not alone in their communities. Um, so the NavCare training is consists of six modules uh, addressing the following competencies. What is the volunteer role? Uh, addressing quality of life concerns and what does that look like and how do you do it? advocating for clients and family, facilitating community connections, promoting active engagement, and supporting virtual navigation. The training is online, um, and so people can log into the online forum and take the training independently, but it's also augmented by face-to-face -face training provided by the hospice organization itself. And these NavCare competencies actually build upon the CHPCA training for volunteers. And so it's not, it doesn't reiterate that. It is meant to really build on top of that knowledge or similar volunteer training. There's a lot of volunteer training that uh, has a lot of that, those components to it. So it's meant to layer onto that. So I'm going to take over from here. Thank you so much, Barb. And so I just wanted to take just a few moments to share with you about the funding opportunity. As I mentioned, uh, Health Canada has made available this contribution for uh, uh, the creation of NavCare hubs um, across Canada. So we're really excited to be able to offer two-year funding um, to hospice palliative care organizations to sort of create this hub and spoke model. So what that means is that the funds would be given to one organization to implement NavCare and that organization would mentor and support the implementation of NavCare into, uh, into uh, two smaller hospice palliative care sites. And so what we're asking the, um, the hubs to have is a dedicated part-time uh, part NavCare volunteer coordinator. And as you'll hear about in a few minutes, that NavCare volunteer coordinator is essential to the implementation of NavCare. It does take a bit of resources. So having that dedicated coordinator really helps, um, helps with that imp implementation. We also ask that the hubs commit to training 30 volunteers across their sites to serve 60 clients across the sites and to co-facilitate educational webinars such as what um, Aaron, Holly, Joy and uh, Anitra are doing today. Um, and then uh, we'll ask for some biannual reporting so we can report back to Health Canada on this, on the progress of implementation. And in return for that, we're offering $60,000 over a two-year period to support that part-time coordinator. So $30,000 uh, per year. And that will uh, also, you'll get access to the entire NavCare toolkit, including that online training. But we also have resources for the volunteer coordinator, such as public education resources. Um, we have uh, resources for face-to-face um, facilitation um, training as well, um, and some other bits and pieces for the volunteer coordinator to um, implement. Um, you will be invited to a monthly hub huddle, which is a, a community of practice of the volunteer coordinators and the, um, uh, the leaders in these uh, hub organizations to not only discuss emergent issues, but also um, or looking at tapping, tapping you into the wider uh, network of hospice palliative care across Canada. So um, that also, for example, connecting you with folks from the virtual hospice, it's just one example. Um, we provide you with uh, volunteer training reports and then um, uh, through partnership with the CHPCA, we profile your hub in, and the work that you're doing as volunteer coordinators or the work that your volunteers are doing, um, we profile that in our knowledge products. So for example, you might've seen um, an e-hospice article on, well, I think it was in July that Joy and the Camrose, uh, Camrose District Hospice was featured in one of the e-hospice. So things like that are what we commit to you. And uh, so 
The key selection criteria, and we're going to go over this in a little bit more detail because it relates to how we think about um, implementing NAVCARE. So uh, thinking about how NAVCARE fits with your organizational st strategic plan, whether you have the capacity to start and sustain, whether you have a sustainability plan in place, the kinds of partnerships you might have um, to support the hub and spoke model. So um, the you know, community providers, the social and healthcare providers. Um, and is there evidence that uh, you can achieve these volunteer and client targets? And um, have you kind of have you identified a clear group of clients in your community um, in, in need of services? And then finally, whether you have that volunteer coordinator to champion the program. So the application timeline, our, our call for proposals went out in October and the uh, deadline is uh, March 1st. Um, and we're gonna turn this around pretty quickly. Uh, so we'll meet and adjudicate the, um, the applications and give you an, an, a decision by March 31st. Um, and then with the expectation that you would start implementation June 1st. And the reason for that bit of a gap between the notice of decision and the implementation start date is because of some process um, things that we need to do here at UBC oh, to get you set up in the system and all that. That was a bit of a learning from this past round that it took a lot longer than we thought. <laughs> So um, all the application materials are, um, including the implementation manual is on our website at nav-care.ca uh, um, or you can just contact me and I will send that application to you. So um, also would like you to know that um, while we have uh, this round of funding, next year we'll have another round of funding as well. So if you really are interested in um, applying to be a hub and you're like, oh, that timeline is a bit too short for me right now. Uh, same timeline for next year with a um, deadline for the application to be March 1st, 2023. Um, so uh, yeah, so we're gonna, we're gonna move on. So the bulk of the rest of this part of the session is really to think about these five questions when considering NAVCARE implementation. Now, this is not just targeting those who might think about developing an application to become a hub. Um, you are most welcome to uh, implement NAVCARE um, outside that funding package. And, uh, but these are the kinds of thing, things that you would want to think about um, to see if NAVCARE really fits with what your organization is, is doing. So we're going to kind of hop around between the slides and between showing the panelists' faces a little bit more clearly. Um, so I'm going to introduce one of the, uh, some of the questions, give you a little bit of background to it, and then I'm going to stop sharing my slides and then invite the panelists to think about a couple of questions that I've that I, I will pose. And so it'll be a little bit of back and forth. So feel free, again, if you have a burning question that you would like answered that is related to, to these kinds of questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll, um, we'll uh, try to get to them. So the first thing that we uh, invite you to think about is whether NAVCARE fits with your organization's strategic plan. Um, and NAVCARE was really designed to help align your services to directions identified by leaders in palliative care in Canada. So Barb talked a lot about the palliative approach to care and the compassionate community approach, as well as um, optimizing the work of volunteers, but also uh, that aspect of educating the public about pall palliative care. So one of the roles of the volunteer coordinator is really to raise the profile, um, not just of NAVCARE, but also about what is um, hospice palliative care and the, and the things that the organization does. Um, and so uh, also uh, thinking about how um, NAVCARE reaches a variety of people with palliative care needs and really complements that international movement to alleviate loneliness and isolation for older people. So I'm gonna turn it over to the, pal uh, to the panelists to ask them to ponder this question. How has NAVCARE aligned with your organization's strategic direction? I'm going to stop sharing here and there we go. 
And uh, I'm going to turn this question first to Erin, if that's okay. For sure. Um, so I think at the Kalen Center, uh, NAVCARE was an, a really clear fit for us because we were already engaged in compassionate community initiatives. And so compassionate community, um, really about like how we can um, turn to the community and fully utilize the community to care for one another and provide some of those mm, extra needs that people have really um, to make it more manageable for them. And um, I think it also aligned with a lot of our initiatives to support people that were living with social isolation and loneliness and noticing how big of a need that was in our area. Lovely, thank you. Um, and Nitra, would you mind um, weighing in on this question as well? Sure. Um, for us, it, it's it's been a real way for us to give back to the community. Um, we're a freestanding palliative care residence. Um, we're uh, privately funded, so through donations. So we have a lot of community support for the people that come into the four walls of our palliative care residence. But we also know that our reach is greater in the community. So being able to give back to people in the community who are in need. So those who may not be ready for palliative care, but could benefit from a palliative approach to care or to, to volunteers who could help them um, receive services in the community that they may not have been aware of. So it's just, it's a really, it's a, it's a great sort of melding of the two worlds where people come to us for a service, but we're actually able to go out and, and provide a, a service to, uh, to people within the community. You're on mute. <laughs> of course I'm on mute. <laughs> I love that idea of reciprocity and um, and that building that relationship with the community. It's, um, thank you for sharing that. Um, Joy and Holly, I'm, I'm not sure how you want to negotiate <laughs> who gets to go first, so I will uh, pass the question between you two. Okay, I'm going to actually go first um, because um, we have been doing NAFCARE for a while and we were we're, because we are kind of a, a rural urban center, we had first started thinking about actually having a building and then realized we had to establish our programs first. So we were working very closely. Our dream was to sit vigil with end of life people. And we soon discovered that we needed to be able to see people earlier to have a relationship with the family in the communities. So when NAVCARE came as a research project to our area, some of our palliative volunteers took it. And it, it really, I would say it was the greatest gift that our hospice society received because what it did, it now made it easy for agencies in the community to refer clients to us as NAVCARE clients rather than palliative clients, which can kind of have a negative connotation. And so it really made it possible for us to follow people then right from early diagnosis or chronic illness, right through to palliative end of life and then grief and bereavement. So it, it expanded what our, like our vision for hospice is community or compassionate communities. And we were looking at how we could help people with isolation and declining health. So really, when NAVCARE, when we were offered NAVCARE, it felt like something being offered to us on a silver platter because it was such a gift. And, and part of um, our hospice district is very large. And so Holly actually is at the far end of our hospice district. So Holly, did you want to add anything? Um. I just quickly wanted to add, so I am the spoke from the hub and probably um, a true rural or remote community. We have um, only 8,700 people or 8,700 people in our community that I'm uh, working with. We have, uh, that's encased in uh, 1,600 square miles of land. So we have a lot of traveling to do. And there is no hospice building here for any of our residents. 
The closest hospice building to us is two and a half hours drive away. So this nav care with a pre-palliative approach is um, very bit important and it's been welcomed with open arms. Every doctor's office, every social worker, every home care team that I go to is just kind of, thank heavens you're here. We need you badly. That's all I'm gonna say. Thank you, Holly. Um, so Joy, you kind of touched upon this question that um, Harry Van, Van Bommel put in, in the chat. He, he asks, what's the difference between NAVCARE and regular palliative care volunteer programs? And so you touched upon how uh, this is much more of an upstream um, earlier approach to reaching out to, um, to uh, patients and families <laughs> and during, journeying alongside them for over a longer period, a uh, longer term. So I wonder if, the, um, if there's anything else that the panelists would like to add um, to the question that Harry posed. It's complimentary service. It's complimentary volunteering that's already being offered in the community through other organizations um, and a little bit of a catchment area because some volunteer volunteering is more uh, for able-bodied or for people who are healthy and they're looking for companionship. And this is, this is that step above for the person that doesn't quite fit into that little checkbox of, of criteria. And so this service provides the, the most vulnerable, the most isolated, um, client, for lack of a better word, an opportunity to be engaged in the community and, and be aware of services that are being provided. So. I would also um, maybe like to add, um, it, in regard to the question about what's the difference between palliative and, uh, and nap care, Whenever I do a presentation, I always introduce myself as being part of the hospice society. And then I tell them, okay, having said hospice and palliative, I want you to totally forget that because now I am dealing with pre-palliative way before anybody is ever, ever dealing with chronic disease or, or maybe just beginning to. But very often our clients um, are not dealing with chronic illness, simply with social isolation and with loneliness. So as I say, it's, it's pre-palliative and out here, we have no palliative. So um, it's a huge difference between that and something that's offered by an actual hospice building or an actual hospice society. Mm -hmm. One of the things I have found though too, though, is that, that a number of our clients that we start seeing with social isolation, especially in many of the seniors residents where they don't have family, we do become that person right through to, to end of life. And, and it really has made a difference for a lot of people within seniors homes because a lot of them are living to over 100. And if they're living to over 100, then their children aren't young either. So, so you know, we, we really are that, that person who, who can sit by the bedside that really knows them. For sure, for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. So um, Janet put a question in the chat box, and I think we're going to um, leave that one to our one to our third our third overall arching question. So um, where we talk about the um, clients and the volunteers. Uh, so hang on for a minute, Janet. We'll get there. Um, so I'm going to um, share my screen again and um, move us uh, forward a bit. Right there. So the next question that we ask you to consider as you think about implementing NAVCARE is whether you have the capacity to start and sustain the program. So things that you might want to think about is the whether you have sufficient number of volunteers to support that program without depleting your current pool of volunteers or that you know where you can recruit, recruit volunteers. Uh, another factor would be thinking about your organizational stability. Um, do you have experienced and stable leadership or are there other issues that are creating instability in your organization? 
We know that even though all organizations experience change, there are moments when these, these changes really leave limited resources for new initiatives such as NAVCARE. And um, at the beginning of when you're implementing NAVCARE, it does take a, a, take a bit of resources, particularly from the volunteer coordinator. So then the third thing to think about is um, whether you're implementing other programs at the same time that re also require significant resources, or do you have a plethora of programs running that make these resources run thin? As I mentioned, NAFCARE does require these ded dedicated resources, especially in that implementation phase. So this is where we're going to answer your question, Janet. <laughs> so about the persons in your community, like who are and, and uh, the panelists have already touched upon this about who they're reaching out in their communities and so it can be you can like reach a variety of people not just those who are sort of labeled palliative care um, so thinking about the folks that uh, might benefit from that more upstream palliative approach to care and that and they're not really currently receiving those services um, those who might be living in long-term care or assisted living facilities, they could be a real um, candidate for NAVCARE volunteers. Um, Joy mentioned uh, programs right through bereavement. So uh, people in your community who are bereaved um, and uh, all of the panelists have touched upon those who are socially isolated or living in rural and like remote locations. So reaching now NAVCARE volunteers supporting those folks. And then uh, also people who are attached to a, a multidisciplinary chronic illness team, um, you could connect with that group as well. But the important thing is, is once you identify who your service group is, it's important to think about how you might reach, um, uh, how you might develop those strategic partnerships that will support you to make connections between your volunteers and those who need the service. So that's part of where, um, uh, the the uh, the um, the amount of uh, resources that go into implementing uh, NAVCARE is about raising uh, the awareness of NAVCARE in your community and and making those strategic partnerships. So I am going to turn it over to the uh, panelists again, and we're going to answer Janet's question as well as thinking about who in your community you're serving, and how did you develop partners, partnerships to reach these people? I'm gonna stop sharing here. And maybe we could start with uh, um, Aaron again. Sure, thanks Gloria. Um, so I think in our area, it is quite diverse in terms of why people um, choose to join NAVCARE. Overall, I would say, um, our population tends to be over 50, partially because that was the scope of practice for us for a long time. We only opened it to um, all adults with declining health in the last six months. But I think it's also reflective of the needs in our area. Um, I think we do see a lot of people with um, social isolation, difficulty managing staying at home. Um, you know, sometimes I'll get called by family members who aren't aware of what other resources are available. Um, and I think, yeah, the chronic illness actually, I think for our area is a major factor in that. So we do see people, I think, joining at all different phases of declining health. Ideally, we're hoping to help people early on because that kind of sets them up for a smoother transition through the different stages of health and decline, but we will get involved at whatever stage people kind of get involved. Um, another big thing in our area is mobility. I think because we were, live in a semi-rural area, I would say you know, 10,000 people in a community is not super rural, but we cover a broader area that is quite rural. Um, getting to appointments is a major challenge for a lot of people, um, especially in the winter um, and then especially as people have changes in their mobilities and sensory challenges, you know, people who might not drive anymore because of their eye conditions. So that's a big part of that. Um, and in terms of the partnerships, um, I think part, like a big part of it is developing the partnerships and making sure that you do that early on. 
So when I started the program in Nelson, I actually spent the first like three months of my contract mostly just reaching out in the community. Um, it was pre-COVID, so there was a lot more opportunity for community presentations and engagement. But um, I would really stress the importance of reaching out to other community service organizations as well and setting up that mutual system of referrals because we refer back out from the program quite a bit because that's the whole resourcing part of it. Um, and that it's really important to do that early on to allay any fears of competition. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's really important to draw those distinctions between we're not healthcare system navigation, but neither are we home care and neither are we doing like all of these other different services that exist in the community. And so showing how we're adding value and making sure that people understand that we're not trying to duplicate things that already exist. Um, and then just a little bit on Janet's question. Um, I think a big part of it is making sure to communicate about boundaries. Um, I think with any kind of um, program like this it does tend to draw those of us who are very empathetic and caring, um, but we're only able to help when we have clear boundaries. Um, and so I work quite a bit with my volunteers to make sure that they understand <clears throat> the time um, that's being allotted. So typically we meet with clients every one oh dear. or two weeks. I'd say it's generally, you know, four to eight hours a month um, and really kind of keeping it to that. And if they have a lot of varying needs, then we work with the client to help prioritize. And in some cases, I'll do some initial referrals to other agencies before I even get a volunteer engaged because I see how important it is. Like, say they immediately need home care. It's like, I'm just going to get that set up <laughs> before we do anything else. And then we can move on to those other kind of more secondary needs. Lovely. Thank you, Erin. And you also touched upon um, Carolyn's question about coordinating efforts between organizations within the community, such as the hospital centers, I guess AHS is Alberta Health Services, um, hospice and home care. So um, yeah, and it's really nice to see this. It's Again, I'm going to uh, return to the word reciprocity, as you talked again about um, Anitra, about reciprocity in the community. So um, thanks for that. So uh, Joy and Hope, uh, can you respond to these this questions? Could I just maybe um, explain, it's actually Holly. Holly, uh, ah, <laughs> yeah, we have Holly, Holly. <laughs> that's okay. But just so you know, I'm the volunteer coordinator with the Hub site and Holly is a brand new volunteer coordinator with one of my satellite sites. So, so just so that people understand, and there was a possibility that I couldn't be here today, so Holly was going to do it for me. So I'm actually going to turn this over to Holly to answer because she's brand new. And so you can hear from a brand new volunteer coordinator. Well, um, now I'm going, hmm. <laughs> um, I think so one of the first things I, so I had my uh, an initial timeline and the first thing was to get some volunteers. And then the next after that was to uh, contact those service providers to let them know we were here. And so um, I, and I have had no problem. I have talked to the PCN. So those of you in Alberta will be familiar with that. So I have talked to all the PCN nurses. I have talked to the home care teams. I have talked to the ministerial committees I've talked to the FFCS coordinators and I have actually wrestled down everybody who walked out of the post office beside me. So um, th those are the partnerships in a rural, in a rural, rural area. Um, and uh, as Aaron mentioned, it was very important and it was very important that I got in and know that I wasn't there to steal their volunteers. Um, I wasn't there to try and take over their organization. I was just there to let them know what we were offering and to see whether or not it would fit any of the needs that they had. Is that, is that good? Joy, mm -hmm. why did you do this to me? <laughs> as I, I like you. Yeah, because I have only been doing this since October. So I'm a babe in the woods. 
but tell them how many presentations you've actually done since then, about 19 or 20? Yeah, I've done 19 presentations now and have about another five or six, probably 10 by the time the, the churches get uh, going um, within the next month. Wow. So I, I'll just add then, because um, we started NAVCARE in 2017. And at that time, um, I developed a really strong relationship with the, uh, St. Mary's Hospital, which is here in town. And they accepted our volunteers as their volunteers. So I did all of the volunteer training for the palliative program and end of life people that were in the hospital. And then when they had somebody that was dying within the hospital or somebody waiting placement into a senior's home, then they would contact me and I would send in one of my volunteers. So we had a really lovely partnership. The other thing, fortunately, that we had in Camrose was a PLOC committee where people, you know, from all of the different organizations were members. So we shared about shared common concerns about how do we get referrals and and so it, it, they knew what we were doing. And currently I'm sitting on what we call a seniors coalition here in Camrose. And all, and all of us work together to take a look at what are the needs in the community and how are we each addressing them. And so we're ex extremely supportive of each other and we meet once a month. And I'll give you just an example of what I'm talking about. Somebody had raised about um, transportation, I think Aaron, you did being a real problem. And so as a seniors coalition, we all have that same problem. So we're working together to figure out, okay, how do we get people from Camrose to Edmonton for their cancer you know, treatments? So, so we've really been able to develop some absolutely wonderful partnerships. So one of the questions that Carolyn then um, uh, added was so like, how have you gained cooperation of these entities? And, you know, um, I'm imagining that there is, you know, some some challenges and and uh, it sounds like you've been successful. So I'm wondering if uh, if any of you would like to touch upon that. Um, and Nitra, I know you haven't spoken to these questions yet. So uh, maybe you could if you have experienced any sort of challenges in gaining cooperation? Um, sure, actually. So unlike my, my friends in rural areas, I'm in a far more urban setting. Um, so in, our, in the three communities that we're servicing right now, we have a population of over 100,000. Um, and we're reaching out into a greater area. So um, the challenge is how do you, has been, how do you identify the people that need the services the most? Um, as a, a palliative care resident, we, uh, so to give you context, we trained volunteers that we already had at the Teresa Deller Palliative Care Residence to become navigators. So we had a, a group of volunteers who were interested in doing more, so we trained them. We haven't gone out into the community yet to, to do training of, of people within the community. Um, so we're still in our infancy in, in development. Um, and we've been sort of strategic in who we are reaching out to. So community organizations that are, that have the greatest reach within the community that really have a pulse on what's going on and have access to all community organizations. Um, so we've met with them and gotten them on side to explain to them exactly that we're not competing we're not trying to get money that you're looking to get we're actually complementing services we're promoting the services that you're offering we just want to know who you're not able to service so I'll give you an example there's one of our community organizations one of the workers there has 287 clients of her own there are 365 days in the year she has 287 clients, like the math just doesn't make sense. So I said, okay, so you have people on a waiting list for sure. There may be three people of your 25 people on your waiting list who could benefit from NavCare services until you as an organization are able to take them on as a client. So they're not falling through the cracks. That's sort of the aha moment for, for some organizations because they're like, oh, okay, so we're not actually, you're not saying no, you're not provide or you're not not giving them service you're giving them 
one small piece of service to then lead to more. Um, one of the big ones for us, because we have a bigger um, territory, is we've really worked with municipalities. Uh, so with the city officials, so not only the mayors and city councillors, but also the city administration. So people who work in public security, um, library services, sports and recreation, community events, they have access to people in the community who are in need of services, right? So it's harder for us as a small organization to find those people who need things, but the person who goes to the library once a week who suddenly isn't doing so well, well, oh, Mrs. So-and-so, wouldn't it be nice if we've got an amazing program that's being offered uh, in NAVCARE, can I give you a referral or I can refer you to their program? So we're working in collaboration with them. We've got some home care, private home care organizations that are uh, partnering with us as well. Um, and it's, you know, every, every conversation leads to another possible partner and the partnership is sometimes very hands-off maybe it's just putting the information on their website sometimes it's just educating their staff sometimes it's just about putting the pamphlet out at their front desk um, but you know as somebody mentioned in the chat uh, you know how has uh, COVID affected us <laughs> um, no, we're not going into people's homes right now so I just got eight referrals in this week and we're going to start with phone call or Zoom sessions with them in the interim. And we hope that by spring, we'll be able to go into people's houses, but you want to be able to keep your volunteers engaged uh, because you don't want them to be a volunteer and then not doing anything because then they lose interest and then go off to something else. Um, you don't want your community organizations to forget about your program because you're not able to service people in the community. So we've gone with the phone call and, and Zoom option for now. Um, and we'll see how it works. Um, <laughs> we're open to everything at this point, so. Thank you, Anitra. Um, so uh, um, there's some great questions coming in and I think they're all quite relevant to um, this particular, um, these questions. Um, so uh, Michelle, uh, asked about what the difference is between Better at Home and NavCare, and I believe that Barb has just posted <laughs> posted a response to that question in the in the chat, where um, Better at Home provides more task specific services, um, and NavCare work, volunteers work alongside clients to provide social support and access to resources. Um, a NavCare volunteer may indeed help clients access Better at Home if it is available. So um, we're going to uh, just move back to our share screen function and we'll um, move forward in these five questions to consider. Uh, here we go. So uh, the next question that you might want to ask yourself as, a, as an organization is, whether you can find the volunteer coordinator to champion the program. So you just heard from Holly about this amazing on the ground work that she's been doing in developing um, uh, partnerships with um, everybody who comes out of the post office. <laughs> and uh, so she's been doing some really incredible work and, um, and it's like people like Holly and Erin, Joy and Anitra who really um, make this program work. And um, so what we've seen um, is that the volunteer coordinator really needs to have strong mentorship and public presentation skills. We have learned, as you can see, that these dynamic coordinators, um, uh, they're, they, these coordinators are really dynamic. They know about their community and um, are central in uh, uh, in promoting NAVCARE within their communities and to their community partners, but also really critical in supporting the um, volunteers and, and supporting how volunteers feel within their roles. Like Anitra is talking about, you know, you want to have those volunteers engaged and during this time of COVID, it's been really, really difficult um, uh, to help them find that and to have that meaningful role that they signed up for. Um, and so, 
uh, uh, having a dedicated NAVCARE volunteer is important. And we've learned that it's difficult to implement NAVCARE with, uh, when the volunteer coordinator was expected to develop the program in addition to current responsibilities or other responsibilities, or if they kind of did this work off the side of their de desk with not enough resources to do effective public public messaging and you heard from Erin that she spent the first three months of her role just you know connecting with her community and um, and Kayline uh, Center is just a an incredible program now because of the really strong efforts that she put in um, to do that and then the last question we ask is whether NAVCARE can be sustained over time and um, some of the, the factors that you uh, um, should think about and some of the questions you should think about about sustainability is um, like what is the role of NAVCARE like what does it do to fulfill in your community and how what do you hope to achieve in the next five years as a result of implementing NAVCARE um, thinking about the kinds of resources that you have and do these resources have funding implica implications one of the panelists noted that you know everybody's scrambling for funds and um, trying not to be in competition with that um, is uh, is um, important to think about. And then um, uh, thinking about how NAVCARE might uh, meet strategic policy directions for organizations in your community or whether there is policy changes necessary to support the development of NAVCARE within your community. And so I am going to turn it over to the panelists again and uh, and ask about these questions. How do you envision um, NAVCARE being sustained over time within your community? And, uh, and can you speak to any of sort of partnership and policy directions that might help sustain NAVCARE over the long term? And I'm gonna just stop my share. All right, so um, maybe we can start with Anitra this time. I know uh, that put you on the spot. <laughs> Um, this to me just becomes another, because we're palliative care residents, we are, that that's who's driving NAV care within the community. I think that just sort of becomes another branch of the uh, volunteer opportunities that we provide in the community. And so you may not come in and do patient care uh, or work at reception, you may be having just as much of an important role in the community as being a nav care um, navigator. So that's how we would do, continue that. It just becomes part of our, who we are as, a, as an organization. One of the things you mentioned um, uh, at the last webinar, Anitra, mm -hmm. was about, um, so we asked the question about um, policy directions over time um, to help sustain nav care over time. And you talked about um, uh, connecting with uh, uh, city councils and getting on that sort of age-friendly um, initiatives. I wonder if you could share share that insight um, with everybody here today. I thought that was really a real powerful insight. If you remember you, what you said. <laughs> I don't even remember at all what I said, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, no, I, I think the reality is that um, uh, cities are changing. Our, our we have an aging population, but we have people who want to give back to the community. Um, and so, and cities have just as much of an important role in that as healthcare. Um, it's not, the health of our seniors and the health of our vulnerable population should not fall solely on the shoulders of the, the medical world. It really does have to fall on it to everybody. And municipalities and cities are, are best suited to ensure the safety and continuity of, of uh, the care to the population that needs it the most. And so, it, you know, age-friendly cities is not just about making walkways accessible for wheelchairs and, and, and uh, walkers. It's about um, accessibility to services. Um, accessibility to Wi-Fi, internet, uh, services within the community, and, and information sharing. Um, so they, they, the role there is about making sure that whenever any department does anything in a city, that the policy is always looking to the most vulnerable population in the community. I think that might have been what I said. 
That is totally what you If not, said. It's, this is what I've said now. <laughs> you, also, you also mentioned on getting on that agenda then. So when cities are uh, and municipalities are talking about um, uh, uh, age-friendly environments and so forth, that NAVCARE is present at that table uh, exactly. and being on that agenda. Because um, as Barb mentioned about the compassionate community approach, it mm -hmm. is pretty much like that, isn't it? It's like, you know, this is everybody's business. Um, and so being on that agenda. So um, Aaron, can you respond to, to these, these two questions? Yeah, I think um, for us, most of our funding has come through grants. Um, and I think, you know, there's different kinds of grants. There's grants for new projects and there's ongoing support. And I think a lot of people struggle to find the, the ongoing support because unfortunately, a program that's proven to work is somehow less attractive than a new program that might not work <laughs> for some things. So and there's a bit of work to be done there. Um, I think going forward, we're hoping to um, develop a more robust program of community donations. And um, I think these are like things that a lot of people really believe in. Um, so I think there's like a rich opportunity there. And in terms of future policy directions, um, one of the big things that we've talked about with other hospices in BC and particularly in the interior, because our province breaks them down into different um, regions is about the funding models through um, the health authorities. And so um, one of the things that we've recognized is that NAVCARE really does help to save on healthcare costs. I think this is one of the reasons that Holly was saying that it's met with such enthusiasm from the healthcare professional environment. You know, I've heard from uh, people in the ambulance service who say they get a lot of calls from people who are just lonely, and that's not really the best use of our emergency services. We want to dedicate that to actual emergencies or people who are going into doctor's appointments because they want someone to talk to. Again, it's really hard to get a family doctor or time with a doctor in our communities. So we wanna make sure that those are set aside for people with health concerns and helping people to prioritize their health concerns. Or again, even in the long-term care facilities, we have wait lists for pretty much every facility in our region and understanding that not only is that not sustainable, but also it's not the most preferred option. A lot of people are really more content to stay at home for as long as possible. And so if we're enabling that process, um, we are hoping that like over time that these cost efficiencies could also translate into greater support for these kinds of programs and to make them more sustainable, particularly in the more rural areas where it's really, really hard to get even like the most basic, you know, home care services going on. So it does provide um, a greater opportunity for our option for our services, but it's also that demand has to be kind of met with support at some level. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to like touch back on something from the previous set of questions um, when someone was talking about in the pat, um, in the chat was asking about collaboration. And I found what's been a really helpful process is bringing it back to what is our shared goal? Our shared goal is to support the client in the best way possible. And so if you bring it back to what is actually important and how can we best support the people in our community, then I think that kind of can just bring the conversation back down to, okay, how can we work together to provide the best services? And I think that the best service to the community is really to make sure that there are a diversity of services that can meet people at different stages in life. And that if people can access multiple resources, I think like that's the best case scenario because <laughs> then they're really getting supported more holistically. It's not all of the pressure on a single program. So I think trying to explain that part too can be <laughs> very helpful and listening to people's concerns, so. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much, Erin, um, and raising such great points. Um, Joy and Holly, do you have um, anything that you would like to add with this? 
Actually, what I'd like to add is like, I, I agree with what everything's been said, but I think one of the things that we probably really need to let the community be aware of is the importance of the role of the volunteer coordinator. Because if you look at the volunteer coordinator, so many people know volunteers within an organization coordinators, where the volunteer coordinator gets people to do something on a unit, for instance, the volunteer coordinator with NAV care is totally different. The volunteer coordinator is a grief counselor. Every client she sees has declining health or loss of life or, um, you know, isolation, they're grieving, so many things. So the volunteer coordinator is a grief counselor. She's a human resource manager. She probably can have up to 100 unpaid employees, which people forget that you still have to do everything that you would do for a paid employee for a volunteer. You have to do the police checks. You have to do everything. So she's a human resource manager. She's a resource finder. Every time somebody has a problem, you have to deal with it, whether it's finding transportation, whether it's who, which community do you link her to? So that no, you can never say it's not my problem because it is your problem because you have to find the right source to get the help. Um, she's a community connector. We've just been talking about the different agencies that, uh, that we have to connect with. She's a re volunteer recruiter. She's a data management person. She has to write everything down, keep stats for everybody to make sure it's worthwhile. She's a program developer. She's an educator. So the volunteer coordinator position is probably the most underrated, but over needed position in the all of NAP care. So, so without it extremely, and I know that from like what Holly's doing, like if I didn't have Holly, like I would be having so much more work because she is all of the above and does an excellent job. So I think people really have to talk about what the volunteer coordinator does because she sees every single client, she supports that person, and it's through talking about the role of the volunteer coordinator that we may get funding to support the volunteer coordinator. So that's, <laughs> I guess it's just, I think it's such a critical aspect to this whole program. And people, because the volunteer coordinator title is so varied in so many different organizations, I think people lose what it really is there. <laughs> Beautifully said, Joy. And um, and every time I meet with you folks and in your coordinate, uh, coordinator roles, I am always just so blown away by the work that you do and entirely grateful for the work that you do because you are incredible human beings. All these different hats you are nicely articulated, all those hats. Um, and so uh, one of the comments that me, um Michelle, Michelle uh, put in the chat, she goes, uh, would you re recommend two staff then? And I think that, <laughs> uh, when, I, when I think about uh, the implementation of NAVCARE, it, it does rest a lot on that volunteer coordinator. And as Joy articulated, there's so much that that coordinator does. And so um, two staff, three staff, four staff, I think you can end up have a lot of volunteer coordinators doing this work in one organization um, as, um, you've all talked about the needs in your community and uh, um, and how you might meet those needs and that volunteer coordinator is that point person. So um, yes, I think um, a number of staff could be really helpful. I'm sure that Holly, you wouldn't mind having somebody take over a few presentations <laughs> for you. <laughs> uh, so um, I am, uh, Michelle, you've nice. also asked if you, I, I'll, I'll share the um, job description for the volunteer coordinator. Um, if you could drop me an email, I'll email it to you, Michelle. So, Gloria, sorry, Joy, go for it. Gloria, can I jump in here for just a minute? This is uh, something that Joy and I have talked about too. And then this is something that she was, I would add to the volunteer coordinator job description is we become the CEOs sometimes of the executive directors. <laughs> we make decisions, I'm thinking of the time thinking, oh, okay um really should we be doing this but uh, so those decisions have to be made they have to be made now uh, and sometimes i sometimes think and as i say i'm new to the organization but i sometimes think that an executive director 
especially in our position where we're um, governed by a, a volunteer board. I sometimes think an executive director um, to help with those decisions, but also to plan fundraising or a fundraising director would be nice. Mm -hmm. Would be nice. Yes, fair enough. All right, so I am going to uh, just move us along and I'm, I'm bearing in mind the time. So it's uh, just um, after after one. And uh, I know we've been having a robust discussion with the chat here as well, but I would like to save uh, some time for questions after um, we, we finish here. Um, and I know our webinars usually go for an hour, but uh, we've decided to plan for an hour and a half this time because uh, um, our last webinar, there was not enough time for questions. So I'm going to share my screen again. And where is it right there? So this is, I think, one of the one of the key questions. And I, I believe uh, Joy has really like nailed it home. What are the uh, like an essential characteristic of success is that volunteer coordinator. But I would like to uh, sort of really ask you to think about um, maybe one or two other aspects of success that uh, what success might look like to you over and above what that volunteer coordinator does. So I'm gonna, I didn't know, I don't know why I needed to put a, come back to the slides, but I'm gonna stop share there. Um, so what are some of the key characteristics of success? Let's start with Anitra. <laughs> oh boy. Well, um, I'll be really honest with you. We're, we're still, as I mentioned, in our, our real infancy in all of this. Um, I think the collaboration and support of uh, key community organizations um, is, is really important. I think having the, a pulse of what the needs are in the community is really important to the su success of the program. Um, and you're obviously, yes, we're all awesome volunteer coordinators or managers or whatever our roles are. Um, but it's also about the volunteers, right? Um, it's not just about the training. It's about um, nourishing their knowledge and their role in the community and their and understanding, uh, listening to them when they bring something back to you and say, you know what, on the intake form, we're missing a specific piece of information. I've gone three times to a house and I've discovered X, Y, and Z, um, that we have to listen to them. They have the hands-on experience. So I may go into a house and do a, an intake, but I may miss something. And so when they say to me, I've got, you know, uh, an issue or here's a great suggestion so that this doesn't happen to somebody else, you, we have to be able to listen to them. And they, they are the experts in the field just as much as we are the experts at putting these things together uh, as chief cook and bottle washer, uh, as Joy <laughs> said we are. Um, but yeah, the, I think paramount to everything is, is your volunteers and who you have and how you support them and how they feel supported in the program. One of the things that I've had as an advantage is I do have a professional coach who's one of my volunteers. So she's helping me mentor new volunteers. And what she does is help them think about once they've been assigned a client, uh, what how they're going to be in their first meeting with this person. So, and I agree very much that, you know, supporting the volunteers is probably the most critical part. You know, I listed all those other things, but it is the volunteers that, that do the work and they really do need to uh, be able to debrief and talk about and get ideas. And, and I find that, you know, I can't have them learn all of the uh, resources available in the community at the same time as some of the other education. So, you know, they come to me to ask a lot about, okay, this, this is the issue with this person. Do you know what resources? And so they're learning a lot of the resources as they do the job, rather than trying to give them a, you know, a book full of resources 
that they're to learn. So, so supporting them in things that they don't need to learn right away so that they can focus on the client is really critical. And I think the joy and my, of the volunteers that um, they stay. And to me, that, that's a critical element of success. I look at how many, why have my volunteers left? And usually it's because of illness or they're looking after, they've learned how to look after somebody and they're working with their families who are, have declining health. So we lose more volunteers because their friends and relatives know about them and they want them for themselves. And so, so that's often what, why we lose volunteers. Erin, would you like to add anything? Yeah, it's funny that that's come up so much because that's actually what I had in mind first too was really the, the volunteer support. And it's definitely something that I've seen um, increase in, in its importance through the period of COVID um, where I've just seen our volunteers go through so many life changes and actually need support for that themselves so that they can show up fully for their clients. And so understanding that that's a big part of your time as well as put aside to make space for those meetings and to find creative ways of, um, you know, appreciating them for their time because that is so huge. Um, yeah, and then otherwise it's really that community engagement piece of getting out early, getting out to a whole variety of different people so that you can be recruiting because you can be recruiting clients and volunteers from the same places we don't really know right we don't know where people are going home to afterwards and you know a lot of our communities have you know rotary and all kinds of different things and then making a plan to go back and check in with those people it periodically you know I've gone back to some groups now because it's been a couple of years um, just to remind them to tell them about changes and updates and um, yeah I think it's really that important piece to to maintain that connection so that it continues to be present in people's lives, even if they're not directly engaged in it. One of the things I'd like to mention about the resources and volunteers, because some volunteers for NAVCARE don't necessarily want to see clients. They may want to work and help you develop your iPad program. They may want to help you with you know, administrative tasks. And yet they're very much an active part of the NAVCARE program. And so every time I interview somebody, I ask them, what else would you like to bring to the volunteer so that we can learn from you? And I found that, you know, it's, it's really been important. Like I had somebody for our database that set it all up for me. It was a volunteer that wanted to help, but was had no interest in seeing a client. And so I think you have to think beyond just client volunteers, you have to think about what, what else can a volunteer do so that they can continue to be engaged with, with your organization. And so it, that, that part's really, I think, critical too. That's a really great, great point, Joy. And, and it reminds me of, of uh, that there are so many different kinds of roles that could use volunteer support and, um, that could help, you know, maybe the other volunteers, like for example, developing the iPad with community resources, like you, you mentioned, that could help the other volunteers who do want to um, work with uh, with clients. That they uh, they'll help each other out in that way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Holly, did you have anything that you would like to add in terms of characteristics for success? Good, and I was talking to Barb about that earlier when we first signed on. I was involved in a project to try and roll out a, um, a program a couple of years ago, and it fizzled because there were none of the initial supports that I have seen with NAVCARE. The, the NAVCARE manual that I was passed, uh, the, passed uh, the information, the PowerPoint positions, or the PowerPoint presentations, all that type of thing that's been available to me as, as a volunteer coordinator has been wonderful. It has saved me so many hours of not having to chase things. Uh, somebody had said, okay, how many hours is supposed to be? Well, they recommend in the NAVCARE manual that it be 21 hours per week. Somebody was asking about some statistics um, about medical things. So what's something I learned from the NAVCARE manual 
was it 50% of people who are socially isolated and lonely will end up with dementia. 30% of people who do not have MAV care, they have, there's a 30% increase in possibility of arterial heart disease. And uh, the last one that shocked me was 26% increase of all over death possibilities if they have somebody who, um, if they have somebody who, if they don't have somebody who addresses that social isolation and loneliness. Again, found in the instructor's manual, it's lovely, the information that's there. Um, it's been a real help to me. I haven't had to drive Joy crazy with questions. <laughs> and that was the key, that's the key element of success, isn't it? Right there. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. <Jenny. laughs> uh, thank you, Holly. Yeah, and I, I know that, um, so the, um, the NAVCARE toolkit is um, what Holly is referencing. So all those volunteer coordinator um, resources, the implementation guide, education facilitation guides, and then the NAVCARE training that's been developed over um, by Barb and Wendy and the NAVCARE partners over the last 11, 12 years. And so they've put a lot of research into it and um, evaluation into it to really develop a very robust program and thinking about what are those pieces that might make it successful. So as Holly indicates, um, having materials available um, and we can always improve on these things. So um, always open to suggestions for what we can do better and what we can do to support volunteer coordinators in a more meaningful way. So um, there's another uh, question from Julie. Are there other NAVCARE hubs in the interior of BC besides Nelson? Yes, there is. Um, and that is uh, Trail BC and uh, being led by uh, Brenda Hooper, Gail Potter and Linda Merlo. Um, and they are connecting with Castlegar and I believe Cranbrook, dear me. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Erin. Um, so yeah, um, so and I guess that that reminds me to to let you know that um, our other hubs. So we've got three hubs uh, represented here: uh, Camrose, uh, um, Tresa Delar in uh, Montreal, and Erin and Nelson. Um, so I mentioned Trail, and the other site right now is in Grand Prairie, and I think. Um, I would like to sort of redress one of the questions about um, about some of the challenges that COVID has has done, and and it's been challenging in every aspect of life for everybody. Um, so to acknowledge that, but um, I, so since we started implementing NavCare, I have just been really amazed by uh, these amazing women here and their teams as well as the others, uh, other sites to, to really be able to, to uh, this is gonna sound kind of, kind of uh, um, pat, but really meet the targets that we've set out for them <laughs> through um, with the expectations from the Health Canada grant. And that even though that there's uh, not able to do the volunteer client um, visits the way you want to, or the training, the way, that you wish you could, that um, you have pivoted to being very innovative in uh, um, ad adopting online ways of interacting, of doing the calls and Zoom interactions with clients, uh, supporting your, your volunteers uh, virtually as well. So uh, just, even though it's been super challenging and I'll let you talk about those challenges in a, in a, in a second, but I just want to acknowledge that it can be done. Like it's just extraordinary what, what you folks have, have really done. So um, I got the 10 minute warning. So I'm just going to ask you each for maybe a couple thoughts or one, one thought about how you've managed to work through this pandemic and still work through this pandemic. Um, and who knows how we work through this pandemic. <laughs> so how about um, starting with you, Erin? Sure, I mean, I think it's been an iterative process. <laughs> um, you know, changing as the information around COVID changes and adapts it. Um, I think one of the big things we've done is 
um, try to make sure that it makes like what we're doing in terms of COVID measures makes sense for our community. So if because we share a health region with Kelowna, if there's a major outbreak in Kelowna, but there's almost no COVID in our communities, we're not going to shut down everything in response to that. But for right now, for example, like everywhere else in the world, it seems like we're having a, a surge. So it made sense to suspend um, in-person visits temporarily. Um, and a major thing that we've done in this year to try to um, make that less of a shock for people is to um, fundraise for some tablets. So we've been working with um, Hope McNally from the Grand Prairie NavCare site to um, learn her processes for like, what are the best things to include on the on a tablet and all these other resources that people can get out of it, but providing that as a means of connection so that people, um, especially as at different points in our COVID trajectory, you know, people have started for months without actually having ever seen the other person. And so we were doing some very creative and funny things like, you know, one person would wave from the balcony and the other one would go down the street because it really does make a difference for people, I think, to be able to see who they've been able, who they've been talking to. And um, that can help them to develop that relationship further, even if it's one of those funny things or, you know, obviously Zoom isn't as, as good, but it, it really does help with all those um, nonverbal communication pieces. Cool, thank you. Um, I'm uh, maybe one more person to, to uh, speak to the, the COVID situation. Um, I'll, just, I'll just quickly say, just because we're still promoting we um it's about maintaining contact with our community organizations and municipalities and reminding them that don't worry we're still here we're still encouraging you to refer people back to us once we're back up and running we'll be able to jump into people's houses or we will start with phone calls or, or zoom um and and equally engaging our volunteers um you know i had a touch base with our volunteers today because I was like, okay, guys, we haven't spoken since uh, December and all of the, the rules in Quebec change daily. Um, and so, you know, we're in a lockdown all the time. Uh, so it, it's, you know, it's, it's um, making them feel like they, they're equally as engaged in, in all of this. So from a starting standpoint, that would be, if you're starting now, it would be, that's still gonna be a challenge. Indeed, yeah. We did use iPads, but we also had volunteers writing little cards that went to seniors' homes so that they could give them to seniors, even though seniors didn't know necessarily, but they would just write a letter so that they would put them in their mailbox for seniors who didn't have anyone visiting. Nice, lovely. All right, so, um, Thank you so much to the panelists for uh, sharing their insights. We do have a few more minutes, uh, six minutes to be able to address any further questions. Um, so uh, feel free to uh, pop them in the chat or I am not sure Kat, if we have the ability to hear people if they unmute themselves, but um, so maybe just uh, additional questions in the, the chat. If, uh, if you raise your hand on Zoom, uh, what I can do is then I can allow you to unmute you so that you can ask your question out loud if you would uh, prefer to do it that way rather than uh, asking your question in the chat. I would just say to anybody who's from Ontario, if you want to get in touch with me through Gloria, you're more than welcome to just for proximity purposes and also depending on where in Ontario you are, if it's urban setting, we can we can sit down and chat. Beautiful. Thank you, Anitra. Well, I would just like to take then the opportunity to thank everybody for um, joining us on this webinar. 
Um, it's very strange not to be able to see you, um, but I, I am, I'm very happy that you joined us. And thank you so much for your questions and your comments in the chat box. And uh, it's been really, really my pleasure to moderate this session with the, uh, these incredible women who are just powerhouses in the work that they do. And I'm very grateful that you joined us today. And um, thank you so much for, uh, for your sharing and your wisdom and insights. So um, for those who, uh, I will be emailing um, the presentation to CHPCA. My contact information is on that presentation, but I also did pop it into the um, chat box. So I will do that again. I don't care. So you can uh, uh, catch me at nav.care at ubc.ca and um, I am pretty responsive on email. So um, if you have questions or uh, would like the RFP package, it is available on the um, website, but I can email it to you directly. Or if you just are curious about implementing um, NavCare outside this um, uh, funding call, you are We'd love to partner with you and, uh, and work closely with you. So thank you again to CHPCA also for hosting this webinar. And um, I hope you all have a really great afternoon or evening. It's afternoon for me, sorry. <laughs> thank you so much. Take care.